New York a couple of months ago, um, I, the first question that I asked was, why me? Um, I'm not a topographer, I'm not a designer. Um, I uh, make videotapes, I, I'm a professor. Um, and, you know, speaking especially in front of a, a German uh, topography uh, association seemed a little bit odd to me. So I asked him what he thought I should be talking about, and we talked about it for a little bit. And he said, um, we came across the, uh, this notion, I was talking about my students using cell phones. And he said, talk about that. And so I'm going to talk about perspective. Um, perspective is a, is a kind of very interesting uh, way of drawing. Um, we teach it in our schools. Um, it's a measure of how good you are at depicting the reality in front of you. Um, and uh, it's, uh, my wife teaches illustration in the illustration department uh, at the school, wants everybody to um, learn to draw through perspective. And I started to think about perspective and what perspective actually was. And um, what happened was that as I examined perspective, I started to begin to understand that perspective involved primarily this right here, the point of view. And that point of view is primary uh, to perspective. Everything goes through the point of view. And um, as, uh, um, as I became kind of aware of this um, about six years ago, uh, these little cameras uh, called flip cameras um, came onto the market. This is before cell phones. Uh, it was a short, very, period, very short period of technology where the cameras were good enough. As a new department head, um, I needed to provide my students with cameras, and I realized that I could buy 35 of these for one of the cameras that we normally bought. And so I bought 35 of them. I gave them to all of the students, just gave them to the students. The students carried them around with them, and they um, they started to um, uh, they started to shoot and record things in their daily life, and they would we would send them out during class. Um, they would f you know we would give them an assignment. Um, they would photograph around in the city without turning their cameras off. We would come back. We would put them on 15 televisions. 15 monitors and watch everything at the same time. And we thought that this was just really a kind of an interesting thing to do. And so I started um, doing it myself, of course. You know, if I'm going to teach my students to use these kind of almost okay cameras, then um, I should be practicing. So what I would do is I would. Um, I would go and have coffee with my wife in the morning. And before I went to have coffee, what I would do is I would take this camera and I would push it into the snow, because it was winter. I'd push it into the snow, I'd um, have it turned on, I'd go have coffee, I would come back and take the camera inside and see what I got. And what, what started to happen was that um, as, I, um, as I got more and more of this footage, that what I discovered was that um, if I was present, the birds did one thing, and if I was gone, the birds did something else. So what I started to do is I started to process this footage. I started to... Uh, look at the footage to, you know, kind of see, you know, what I could um, get out of it. Um, one of the things that uh, I found was that the resolution was really very bad. And so I started to um, put more than one layer of the image on top of one another 
and delay them a little bit. This is nothing new. I mean, what I was looking at was I was looking at the way the bird, the individual bird moved, the way that the, the way that they kind of came, you know, down here and kind of fluttered and, and the way that they fought and the way that they um, took off and the way that they just sat, you know, and, and it's something that um, I was able to do is to become an observer and an observer of uh, just everything that was around me. I could take this camera, I could just put it someplace, um, I could carry it in my pocket if I saw something, I could just take it out and I could record it. It wasn't connected to anything, but it was much, much better than uh, anything that was in the cell phone. But it was nothing new. There have been motion studies before, and the motion studies um, you know, uh, uh, Moybridge is, you know, really quite well known uh, for his motion studies. And a lot of what I was looking at was I was looking at the individual entity, the bouncing ball, you know, the, the way the horse trots, the way that um, things happened. So I went back to this notion that uh, perspective of perspective and questioning perspective. And perspective is the world as I see it. Um, everything goes through a point. It's your point of view. It's your perspective. We have language for it. Uh, we've been thinking this way for a very, very, very long time. It's primarily egocentric. It's primarily an individual um, kind of way of looking at the world. I see this world through my eyes. I want you to see the world the way that I see it. It's very interesting. It's especially um, prominent in filmmaking. And because I'm a professor in a school of filmmaking and video and animation, that this notion of the director, the cameraman, the you know lighting director, the director this, the director that, the you know everything about filmmaking um, goes through a lens, goes through a point of view. I want to tell a story. I want to make it clear. I want to make it. I want to make it in this kind of, you know, I am seeing it. This is about me, right? And so um, looking at these cameras, I started to, you know, think about these audiences and what the audiences, what we were actually doing with the audience. And the audience is kind of like this. You're sitting there. You're supposed to be somewhat quiet. You're supposed to be attentive. You're not supposed to bother your neighbor. Um, you know, it's like there's, there are these rules of engagement in a forum like this. Because what's driving this is this notion that I have something that I want to say. And you have something that you think, you know, there's an exchange. There's an information exchange here. But it's a really kind of bizarre thing because as my students started to use these cameras, they started to not want to go to the movie theaters as much. They wanted to start watching films online. They wanted to start watching films on their, on their little cameras. They wanted, there was this shift that was going on, and I felt that there was this shift that was happening. And I, was, I started to look for, uh, first of all, I started to, try to make 3D models of group, uh, groups and uh, algorithms that made groups kind of move around in one way or another. Um, but I found that it wasn't really quite working. And then came YouTube. And YouTube is broadcast yourself. Broadcast yourself. This is perspective. You know, this is... I am the producer. I want to get online and I'm going to broadcast myself. It's the same sort of 
It's the same agreement that we've made for many, many years that is driven by this notion that I have something that is important to say. And I think everybody has something important to say. I'm not questioning that. I don't question that at all. I think everybody has something really important to say. That's not, you know. But YouTube was resourced through advertising. And as I started to upload these little clips to YouTube, I started to get advertisements. And I thought, well, I don't like to wear a t-shirt that advertises Coca-Cola. Because I don't want to, I, I want Coca-Cola to pay me to wear the, adver the advertisement. You know, I don't want to give my advertisement away for free. You know, and the same is true here. I don't want to connect an advertisement to the work that I do because I don't have any, I don't have any sense of that. I don't have any idea of how that media object is triggering the advertisement. It's cloaked. So what I started to do is I started to use um, Vimeo. And Vimeo is resourced through subscription. So you pay a subscription, you get uh, unlimited upload. Um, they, um, uh, they take the original video and they um, put it in some magic mountain someplace so that you can retrieve it uh, if you want it. And then they stream, um, they stream the footage for you. I still felt like what was going on with everybody carrying around cell phones was something that was equivalent to the telegraph or the, the, um, the television or the railroad or bronze or, you know, there, there was some dynamic shift that was going on in the way that we should be thinking about what we're doing. And I, I was just looking for models. Because there were no really good subscription models or no video upload models, I made this, um, uh, this interface for my class with a colleague of mine. And <clears throat> one of the things that I objected to about YouTube and about Vimeo is that you, you need to attach a word to the video in order to find it. And I was making very abstract things. So what was I going to do? I was going to say, I'm going to call this one yellow. Well, that didn't work. I'm going to hashtag this 5797555. Well, maybe that would work if somebody knew what that number meant, but that's not going to work, right? So if I had video, an image as language, so I, I believe that image is language as well as the written word is language. I mean, otherwise, we wouldn't look at design is, is in loving ways that we do. Uh, and so, you know, what, I, what, we, what we made here, and this is under, you can look at it online, it's RISD.TV. TV for Tuvalu. It's the country code for Tuvalu. You know, like, you know, Germany has a country code well, TV got given to Tuvalu, some island in the Pacific that nobody knows about. <clears throat> um, and so what you were able to do is you were able to upload a video and say I'm here and I want to respond to this video and I make a link here that bridges this. If this person wants to respond to this one, they can respond to it directly, but they can also respond to my response. They can respond this one to this one. This one was put after that. So as these go down in the tree, that um, each one is a, is a kind of timeline. So this one comes first, this one comes second, this one comes third, this one comes fourth. The only sorting that we do here is in something called the chrono highlighter. And what the chrono highlighter does is it allows you to narrow a span of time. <clears throat> when you narrow the span of time, they turn red so that you can see which ones occurred when. Um, and what we did was we, we made 
an agreement with um, a school in um, in Korea, South Korea, and that did not speak any English, and none of our students spoke Korean, and we we had them sending images back and forth, and the only rule that we had was that nobody could speak in the image, right? So nobody could be speaking in the video. They all had to be visual, which was a really quite a, an interesting thing. Along with, um, along with video uploading came compression. And there are two kinds of compression, two, basically two kinds of compression. These are, these are methods of making the image smaller in order to uh, upload it and download it. And spatial compression um, works horizontally and vertically. And what happens with uh, spatial compression is that this pixel stays the same. It stays the same all the way across here. You can say this pixel is repeated 150 times. That's smaller than saying pixel number one is white, pixel number two is white, pixel number three is white, pixel number four is white. Pixel yeah, that's tiring. Temporal compression does the same thing, but on the time scale. And so what I started to think about was I started to think that um, when I made a, a videotape or a, any kind of image recording, what I was doing was I was creating a data block, a block of data that I could look at from the side, I could look at from the front, I could look at from the top, from the bottom, from the rear, I could spin it around. Because this is the way the computer sees this. It doesn't see it sequentially unless I want to play it sequentially. And so I, I began to rethink the way that I wanted to make video. I was also quite interested in this kind of group behavior. Just If you could turn it down just a little bit. I was interested in this group behavior. And um, so I kept my eye open for places where um, uh, a species uh, gathered in groups. And then what I would do is I would take a block of that time and I would kind of compress it into one frame and then move down a frame, do the same thing, move down a frame, do the same thing. And <coughs> I started to get these really kind of interesting results, these visualizations that were only available if I included not the moment, which I also found to be very perspective oriented, not the individual moment, which is so primary in filmmaking, but a kind of block of time. So these are crows. In Providence, at sunset, during the winter, for 20 minutes every night, 5,000 crows fly from different parts of the state, congregate um, in this area, um, fly around, settle in trees, and go to sleep. So I started to show these things. And where I showed them, I uploaded them. But I also started to show them in places that were not theatrical. And I wasn't looking to, I mean, if, if I'm looking for some other way to think about the world, if I'm looking for some other way to think about this new universe that we may be living in, I don't know if it's a new universe yet, but it's a different universe, certainly that um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to look for places to show these that were not theatrical. And so I started showing them in hallways, in um, entranceways to museums, in galleries, in, in places where you would turn a corner and come upon them, um, on windows in storefronts so that you could see them at night if you were walking around. And 
and what started to happen was that um, uh, people started to give me information that they um, they knew something about crows. They t started talking about Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe lived in the same place um, and wrote mystery novels. This is a this is a really kind of Providence is ripe with mystery. It's spooky. It's a spooky, spooky town sometimes. And, and those mystery novels of Edgar Allan Poe seemed to make a lot of sense. And as I started to think about this flock of crows that um, come every night, I stopped thinking about it as a single occasion. I started thinking about the, the uh, crows as having come to this place since they were dinosaurs and what that might be. There's, there's scientific evidence right now that birds started out as dinosaurs, that in, that in the evolutionary chain, they were dinosaurs first and now they're birds. And, you know, and, you know, did, did dinosaurs group together in the same way? You know, when did they start grouping together? Why are they grouping together only at this time? Why are they grouping together only during the winter? I mean, there were just many, many questions that I started to ask about these. And then um, I needed to, at some point, begin to explain exactly what I was doing with these because there were questions. So this is a XYT graph. Each one of these is a movie that is playing one frame later in time. This is the original uh, video of ants crawling across a piece of paper heading towards some cat food. This, these are the ribbons that they make in time. And there, over there, is this up here condensed into one, one picture. Does this make sense to anybody? What? Well, so-so? Who, who else is so-so about this? It's interesting that ants turn from their tail. You know, it's like they, they do this kind of, you know, they, they kind of walk like, you know, like they swagger a little bit. You know, but I always thought that ants, you know, they, they laid down a scent and everybody followed the same path and the ants did this whole thing and then you start asking other kinds of questions. Like, they have this piece of cat food and they can, you know, 25 of them can surround this little piece of cat food, right, and carry it in, the direct, in a single direction over... How do they do that? So, I spent about five years just kind of posting these things, you know, you know, like 80, 90 of these little films. And then in January, um, uh, they, it exploded. I'm going to back this up just a little bit. So, in Janu between January and March, there were 5.3 million hits on the site. 5.3 million. And it struck me that this was probably not that odd. That there were plenty of things, plenty of moments in the internet world where something just kind of blew up and then it kind of faded away, like this long tail. You know, this, you know about the long tail? This is, this is where, you know, uh, you want to listen to me, right? This is this is the the original kind of blockbuster film that you go to and you see it because it's exciting and it's there and it's whatever. And then this is Amazon and eBay, and this is all of the things that are. This is Netflix. This is all. These are all of the things that stay on the web forever because the network doesn't forget. 
So as we're, as we're continually uploading, as we're continually pouring our data into, um, uh, into the sky, what's happening is, uh, this is an interesting thing, then, you know, what, what, you know what, what starts to happen is that it starts to come back to me in very, very different ways. And so these birds, these little images that I've been making, you know, get sent out. They have a trajectory of their, themselves. They have a data trajectory. They go from uh, my computer to the server. The server serves it to a blog that then goes to another blog that then goes to another blog that then goes to this uh, blog in Arabic. And I thought that this one was especially interesting you know, because of the relationship between these, the gesture of the type and the gesture of the, the birds. It's just, uh, it was just really thrilling. But I started to get lots and lots of different kinds of feedback. As I diminished myself and made these things free, like freely available, but, down, but not downloadable, right? So I still own them in some way, but what I can do is I can trace where they go. And tracing where they go is very, very similar to me than tracing the, tracing the flow or the flight of a bird through a sky. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting kind of um, way of looking at the data that we're producing that it's not just I'm putting it up to the sky, to the cloud, and somebody can look at what I've done. It's that I put it up, somebody likes it, they give it to somebody else, 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 somebody else, and it passes around from place to place um, over time. And it would be really nice to find some way of taking that information and gathering that information and sort of understanding it. Um, as we look at this data that we're collecting, um, there are a couple of really interesting things that are going on. Google um, uh, has been uh, working with um, traffic management. And what they've been doing is they've been tracking telephones. And the telephones, a lot of telephones are in automobiles. And you know where the telephones and the automobiles are because you can geoposition them. And you can very, very quickly see how many telephones are stuck in one place and how many telephones are spread out in other places and redirect the traffic. This is a, this is a way of looking at, looking at us as a flock, looking at us as this group. But what, what do we do? We give up, a, we give up some of our personal um, uh, privacy. I mean, I think that that's, is that a trade that we're willing to make? Is that a trade that, you know, it's like, well, maybe if I get something back, yeah, it would be great if I could, you know, that sort of thing. But I think that there's this kind of change that's occurring. Rusty Lansford sent me this without any explanation of what it was. Um, he said, um, uh, I, would like to, uh, I would like you to work with this footage. I said, okay. It's <laughs> great. He says, my colleagues and I have been looking at your work all day on Friday. We get together and we look at things and we just am um, fascinated by the amount of data that you have uh, been able to visualize in these images that you're making. It's just incredible. So I wrote him back and I said, so what am I looking at? He wrote back, he said, this is a time-lapse CT scan of a quail heart, an embryonic quail heart being formed. So this is happening at the, this is happening at the, mole the, at the cellular level as the, uh, uh, let's look at that again. Oh. 
And what they're trying to do is they're trying to track how those, uh, how those cells are moving amongst a living creature. Well, they, they move in the same way in us. And there's something about the way that we're, we're vessels for this kind of teeming mass of cells that are moving in this kind of, it's just a really interesting way. Once I stop thinking in this kind of perspect, clearly perspective way, then I can start to imagine different things that are occurring. So people started to talk to me about DNA. And John Liebler um, is really, a, he's a 3D artist who's visualizing what happens at the um, microcellular level, right? <laughs> and so those, those <laughs> what's this? <laughs> oh yeah, okay, I'll do it again. Uh, um, you, this is online, so it's a much longer clip. Uh, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to show it all. Come on. So, what's interesting here is that these cells are forming these entities, are forming these entities, uh, and um, they're not being directed. So I got this other call from these microcellular biologists in New Jersey, uh, Long Island, who were offering a conference, and the name of the conference was Autonomous Collaboration. I think autonomous collaboration is a really very, very interesting way of looking at this. It's like everybody is autonomous. Everybody is their own individual, their own being, but you know, when we have a story to follow, when we have some overarching directive, you know, some overarching kind of idea, like um, you know, I'm a tourist, it's my job to take pictures. Right? This is a, this is a kind of a narrative. I'm a tourist, it's my job to take pictures. It's my job to take pictures of interesting places. And so what I do is I get out my camera and I, you know, and I take pictures and they upload and suddenly there are lots of pictures of Notre Dame, um, which is sort of interesting. But I started to get interested in those places where, like you, like starlings do this murmuration thing. Everybody's seen this where they come up and they kind of form these big balls and they just kind of dance around in the sky and they split and, you know, and they look like an amoeba or they look like a, some sort of, you know, wonderful creature. So um, I, got a, I got another message in my mailbox with um, this image, which is a fire ant fire ants inhabit the southern part of the United States. And um, what's interesting about fire ants is that they have this really very, very interesting behavior. Um, they, they're being studied by, um, by nano, nanophysicists. And what they do is that when their, their uh, home floods, they grab onto each other. Um, they take all of their eggs, they put their eggs in one spot, and they hold on to each other, and the little hairs that are on their backs um, form a kind of little uh, repellent for the water, and they um, wind up floating, and floating is a kind of semi-solid so you can press on them, you can push them underwater, you know, you can, you know, and they'll just continue to hold on to each other until they, you know, they um, dry out. And so they're individuals, but there's this example of them forming this other kind of entity, uh, which is a sort of an interesting, uh, interesting thing to me. And then, the beekeepers started to get in touch with me. 
And beekeepers are, there are some beekeepers that are very, very curious. This is a, uh, Taggart Seal, Siegel is a filmmaker um, who uh, is in love with bees and um, thinks, of, um, thinks of the colony as a single unit. Um, there's a wonderful book called uh, Honey Bee Democracy. And in the book Honey Bee Democracy, um, the, uh, the author has uh, done things like measured the temperature of a beehive over winter. And an active beehive will, will stay warm over, over the winter, a specific temperature. The, the bees can control the temperature of the hive by tightening up their wings. And so they, they do this kind of <coughs> over and over again, and you know they get hot. <laughs> and they can keep the hive at a, at a constant temperature. They also divide, <laughs> you know, they divide, they reproduce. There's a reproducing organ in the, in the hive that uh, makes genetically duplicate, uh, duplicate bees. So all of the bees in the hive stem from the same queen. Um, the queen is not the, the, not the queen, not the ruler of the hive, but essentially the sex organ of the hive. And if you look at all of, and if you were to describe all of those things, you would say that they were, the bees are a single unit. Think, the bees are a single entity. If we're thinking about perspective, then what we're doing is we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about each bee as an individual. I'm going to go forward just a tad. Um, these are bubbles uh, under stress, and there are fractures in these, uh, in these bubble formations, and there are fractures in bubble formations. And when I see something on the street that seems weird, seems like a fracture, then I start to question that. And right, right here, what I see is that uh, the man has elected to use their cell phones or their tablets to uh, take a picture rather than their big DSLR. And this is a really kind of interesting because they're all sharing things. They're sharing it. They're sharing it up and, they're, and everybody's sharing. Everybody's taking pictures and it's sort of like a compound eye. If you look at it, uh, and you look at all of the pictures that everybody's taking at the same time and figure out some way of making it all kind of fit together, um, then uh, what we're able to do is we're able to take a picture of the world, take a picture of this world this day um, from every point on the world where there's a person with a cell phone and we can upload them at the same time and it's kind of like us as humans have this eye, which I think is sort of interesting. But there's also these fractures and these fractures are places where, um, where um, this is just about ending. Um, this is at the RISD graduation. Now, in RISD graduation, there are 2,000 people out there in this audience, they all have cameras. Some of the cameras are equipped with telephones. <laughs> if you know what I mean, you know, like uh, they're cell phones, but they're more like cameras than they are phones. Uh, they can text, they can do all these things, but they're cameras. And, um, and there's this ritual that occurs at the beginning of the celebration. And this is the song that is sung. Please, please turn off your mobile device. <laughs> including cell phones, including pagers, and anything else that
that beats, vibrates, or makes a noise that would disturb people around you and cause people to look at you funny all day. Listen to the crowd. <laughs> they're going wild. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not staying quiet. They're not staying still. They're not doing any of that. They're taking out their cell phones and they're saying, I'm uploading. <laughs> you know? Anyway, thank you very much.